Um, my talk is actually called Genes and Environments and How Do They Act or Interact to Cause Parkinson's or to Cause Progression. So why would we want to do population-based studies? Why would we want to study the environment and, and the genes? Well, for geneticists, it's really about discovering the gene so you know something about the biology, and then you can maybe identify the gene carriers. But what do you do then? Well, you know that somebody's maybe at risk or will develop the disease, but that's, you know, that's where it's often left. Clinicians want to know whether there's a prognostic model and they can identify treatments for you. But as a population and a health scientist and environmental scientist, what I want to know is who is sensitive to certain exposures that then increase their disease and how can I prevent these people from being exposed? Okay, so it's two questions. Who is sensitive, and that might be genetic, but also who then receives what type of exposure that then causes their disease? And the opposite coin is what kind of exposures, what kind of lifestyles can you have that actually protects you against the disease or that actually slows down progression once you're hit? Okay, so that's what we are studying. And we actually came up with quite a lot of things so being male is one of the risk factors. So, and you know, it's not something we want to prevent. We like our husbands and sons, but you are at higher risk. And especially you're at higher risk when you're aging. And so the main risk factor for Parkinson's we have figured out is aging. And unfortunately we haven't figured out how we prevent that, right? So, and it probably won't happen, but maybe there's something about aging that goes faster in Parkinson's. And indeed, in, now that I have the blood and the saliva of 850 Parkinson's patients that I collected over 20 years in my career, and as many volunteers from the population who did not develop Parkinson's, we were able to look at certain signatures of aging in the blood, they're called methylation signatures. And one of my colleagues at UCLA developed a clock for aging from these signatures. And we were able to show that the immune system of Parkinson's patients is older than that of controls. So something happens with your immune system in the periphery, not in your brain, that actually makes that system age faster. And it points to, okay, maybe there's something that your immune system is fighting or doing that we could intervene at much earlier. So aging, family history, we are back to the genetics um, uh, that might put you at risk. And then what I have been um, studying a lot are the environmental factors that are pesticides, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But we also think that maybe metals and solvent exposures contribute, and of course, head trauma. That's all on the risk factor side. But there's also something um, on the protection side, and we already heard that uric acid might be one of the agents that we, we are looking towards helping because they're antioxidant, right? Well, this did actually not just come from animals. This came from human beings and us observational scientists looking in the population at those people who had higher urate levels because they, have, they develop gout, right? That's a side effect of having high urate. You have gout. So we were able to look at patients with gout and see whether they had a higher rate of developing Parkinson's and we found that was not the case, they had a lower rate of Parkinson's. So that gave us the first clue to a protective agent, and that was an observational study. I myself studied um, NSAIDs, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, to see whether those patients who are taking a lot more of them for uh, bone diseases, for backache, and that was in the Danish population, would actually have a lower risk at developing Parkinson's. But unfortunately, we didn't see it. However, the Danish population gave us another way of studying um, an uh, the, the blood pressure drug is Rodopin that's now being also tested in Parkinson's patients because it's a drug that was developed and used already in the 60s. It's, an, um, it's a calcium channel antagonist 
because the heart has the same kind of or similar kind of channels as that dopamine neuron in the brain, and we've been using it to lowering blood pressure for 40, 50 years. So in the Danish population, I was actually able to look at who was getting this L-type channel blocker over how many years, and what was their risk of developing Parkinson's disease, and it was 30% lower. So that was the first clue that then colleagues of mine used to say we need to have these clinical trials on Parkinson's patients. So observational studies can be extremely helpful. Caffeine is the other example, right? Every, every study, epidemiologic study out there shows that Parkinson's patients drink less caffeine. And so the opposite would be, maybe if you drink more caffeine, you would be protected against Parkinson's. Well, I am not subscribing to that yet because you all know from your own experience that Parkinson's actually starts a long time before you develop the motor symptoms, right? And it starts with sleep problems, it starts with constipation, it starts with lots of symptoms that may make you change your diet and may make you lay off caffeine. So that's why it says there reverse causation. Is reverse causation a possibility, meaning that you have your Parkinson's slowly developing, starting in the periphery, and you're changing your lifestyle. You're exercising less, you're changing your diet, you're not drinking coffee, and you stop smoking. Because all of you probably know that you know every single study in the world shows Parkinson's patients smoke less than non than people who never developed Parkinson's. And nicotine has been um, highlighted, of course, as a possible protective agent for the brain. I don't believe it. I think all that happens when you are starting to develop Parkinson's is you lose your nicotinic response. So you're not as addicted anymore. And when you try to quit, you can, right? And so to introduce nicotine and smoking again is probably not helpful. Indeed, we were able to follow 500 of these 800 Parkinson's patients we enrolled in the Central Valley and looked what happened to those who actually continued smoking. They had a much higher risk at early death. Okay? And they had a higher risk than the population controls who told us they were smoking. So once you have Parkinson's, it doesn't help you. It doesn't slow down disease, and it even advances you towards higher, mort earlier mortality. You know, you're dying earlier. So you don't want to pick up smoking, in my mind. And I think it's reverse causation, if you ask me. But, you know, we're all hopeful. Maybe nicotine can help for something, but we haven't figured out yet what it is. So genes and Parkinson's, I'm only showing this slide to tell you that really we believe that we only can explain 5 to 10% of Parkinson's cases through actual genetics where one gene causes the disease, okay? No more than 5 or 10%. There are lots of other genes, however, involved in your disease, but they are like risk factors. They, they load the gun, but they don't pull the trigger. So there must be something else that does that. And what is it? Well, for me, in, in the, in the mid-90s, there was that pesticide story out there, and nobody had really been able to look at it um, consistently or with really good data. And California has really good data on pesticides. But why, why would we be worried about pesticides for the general population? We know farmers are exposed, right? And not, none of you are probably a farmer. Um, but and you all got, par or some of you got Parkinson's. But what we actually found in the re uh, National Representative Survey of the US population in the 2000s, in six to 59 year olds, 96% of all the urine samples they took from these people had measurable levels of an OP pesticide called chlorpyrifos. And that's because it's an insecticide and it was used in homes. And diazinon is a similar kind of insecticide but used in the agriculture, and that was found in 30% of all samples of urines from the general population. So what that tells you more or less is that we use pesticides in so many different ways that all of you were exposed at some point. Uh, me too, 
And we all have DDT derivatives in our blood. If we test them now, we all have them because they're on our food, okay? And they're very long lasting and we're importing food from places that still use DDT or still have used them for many years. So we were all exposed. That said, it's really hard to measure pesticides, except that in California, when I targeted the Central Valley counties of Fresno, Tulare, and Kern, there is a system that allows me to measure pesticides, and i show you what that is. So over the years, since 2001, we collected data on 850 Parkinson's patients and controls from the same area. And this is a map of the system that we use. It's called the Pesticide Use, use Reporting System of California. And it clearly shows you where the pesticides are being used, right? Central Valley, because that's where the agriculture is. And in this case, it's Paraquat, which is an herbicide, a wide, widely used herbicide. And what is special about California that no other state has is a pesticide use reporting system. Actually, Arizona is starting one. And so what they do is they ask applicators, including farmers, where they are spraying it, when they are spraying it, um, how much they are spraying, and on what type of crop. And all of that data is electronically available. So I started mapping these data with my students, and this involved lots and lots of students. So here is an image of, um, of farming communities, and you see houses and then fields right next to it. These are the maps, paper maps, big rolls that we got from offices all over the counties, from land, you, uh, land offices. And they give you fields, and they give you the communities, and they give you streams, and we computerized it. So this is a computerized image of the same map. And then we could overlay it with the data for pesticide use, and you can now see what the pesticides were used on. These are almonds. So this pesticide was used in this quadrant on almonds and not used on grapes, because the, um, this is a grape orchard, okay? So we were able to computerize all of this data and map it. And then not only that, we asked our patients where they lived and worked. We plotted their address on a map. And you see the map here. And we drew circles around it. And we now know how much pesticide was applied in the vicinity of like a few hundred meters, which is a quarter of a mile from that home. Okay? And we have that for, since 1974, for a very long period of time. So why is this important? Because you see here, that's a plane, a little yellow plane up there, and they're spraying pesticides, and there are homes down here. Okay? So the whiff of these pesticides can easily go over homes and um, uh, expose whoever is there. And workplaces, same thing. So when we questioned what our colleagues were seeing with mice and rat models, this is a rat, um, for paraquat and manep, paraquat that herbicide, manep a fungicide, where they saw that these animals develop Parkinsonian features, and there's actually now a paraquat model of, of Parkinson's, um, we were able to reproduce that with the system of exposure assessment that I just showed you for people in the Central Valley and you see that the, oops, uh, here. You see that the risk is 70% increased if that spraying happened in 500 meters or a quarter of a mile from your home over those last 30 years. And this was the first study, by the way, that showed this in humans. Um, and then we said, well, but not everybody who lived near these fields got Parkinson's, right? So what else is there? And this is when uh, colleagues of mine from Washington actually said, well, there is something called the dopamine transporter, DOT. And that dopamine transporter also might be increasing your vulnerability to these agents because they are transporting dopamine and they may also be transporting this paraquat into the brain. And they, they figured out which, which genes are actually determining how fast that transport goes. And then we use the genetic markers, and you can see here, these people were, um, had these risk alleles and were not exposed to paraquat. Ah, good. And these people 
had the, had, sorry, the risk alleles are here. So these people had the risk alleles without exposure. You don't get Parkinson's. But if you are exposed and you have these risk alleles, then your, your um, risk actually is almost fourfold. Okay, and if you only have one risk allele, it's about two and a half fold, but if you have two of them or more, it's about four fold. So this is exactly what genes by environment means. You have a genetic susceptibility and then you're exposed. So you don't get the disease because of genetics. You might not get it when you're exposed, but when you're susceptible to that exposure, you do. And we also showed this for organophosphate pesticides with another mechanism for a gene, and I don't have much time to go over it, but it's basically the same story, you know. You have to have exposure and that gene, and that's when your risk really goes up. And it also works for home use pesticides, so the other models were my, my pesticides from the Central Valley. This is, we asked people to report home use, and it was exactly the same story for home use. Um, and we figured out lots of these kind of stories, and it's all in a paper we recently published. We also figured out that there's an interaction between paraquat, that herbicide, and traumatic, traumatic brain injury. So this is your risk just for the pesticide, just for traumatic brain injury. When both come together, your risk is much increased, meaning there's also an environment-environment interaction, right? If you have two factors coming together from the environment, your risk increases even worse. And we also study disease progression, and we are now following these patients over time, and we're trying to figure out what predicts progression, and we have figured out there is a synuclein gene that seems to be predicting motor progression. And since I have very little time, I'll just show you that we just now got this paper published where we used a lot of different uh, SNPs. They are called single nuclei, uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, so, so little genetic markers that when you add them up, you can actually predict motor and cognitive progression. And these people are at higher risk. And this is really important because when pharmaceutical companies want to test drugs, they want people who are at risk for that outcome. And cognitive decline, not everybody luckily has fast cognitive decline, right? But a subgroup of Parkinson's patients really do have it. And if we can figure out who that is, and now we can with this, then we can actually say these are the people we should, tr we should try this on. Right? And that's why our studies are important. So we also showed that caffeine has a good effect on progression. So maybe that trial with the caffeine, um, uh, uh, the A to A antagonist will work. And then generally what we find about progression when we follow people is that it's better if you've been educated, but you can't change that, but you can keep your mind active. It's better if you can sleep normal lengths. Too much sleep is not good. It's actually good to drink a little bit of your wine or liquor, and definitely exercise helps. So those people who reported having a glass of wine, having a little bit of alcohol, sleeping normal amounts of time, and exercising are doing better over time. And that's observational. We're not doing anything. They're just reporting this to us. So this is a new frontier, and it's my last slide. We would like to find out what microbes do, because one, one thing we now think happens is that PD might actually start in the gut, and might actually be a disturbance of microbes who are giving you lots and lots of signals to the brain, but also contributing to lots and lots of what's going into your bloodstream in terms of toxins, but also other agents that are positive. And so what we hope to do in the future is also study the environment-gut interaction in patients and uh, do these kind of studies in an observational manner to figure out what is happening. And uh, we do all this because we know that we need a strong scientific um, uh, front story to justify and stimulate intervention and treatment trials, just like my Esradipin study in Denmark was. 
Thank you.